Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight um, for the SOAS Centenary Lecture on Human Dignity and World Order. And welcome particularly to all those people who are joining us because this is being live streamed across the world. I'm Marie Staunton. I'm Chair of the Board of Trustees um, of SOAS. And this lecture tonight is the last given in a series given by world figures. So we welcomed in this series of lectures the uh, Nobel Prize winning poet and playwright, Roy Selinka, we've uh, the actor and social activist, Forrest Whitaker, the food writer, Claudia Roden, the writer and lawyer, Raja Shahada, and the human rights activist and lawyer, Hina Gilani. And this isn't even the last of our centenary events. They'll continue to the end of the year. As chair of the Board of Trustees at SOAS, we see part of our role is ensuring that the university keeps open a space, keeps open a space for challenge. And SOAS does challenge conventional views. One of our jobs is to open our minds to new ways of thinking. And SOAS looks at the world from a different perspective. It looks at the world from the perspective of our regions. And if today you go and look at the exhibition that's on in this very building in the Brunei wing, you'll see an illustration of that. The exhibition celebrating art and music, the SOAS collection, uses in a really vivid, really exciting way Music, musical instruments, paintings, maps, sound, performances, to bring to life the depth of the vivid culture of these regions. You'll see a kora, a calabash harp uh, made in Gambia, used by some of the most famous Malian musicians, and also a 17th century hand painted scroll of the Korean mission to Japan in all its pomp. There are things there that haven't been seen in public before, and I do urge you to have a look. It's on till the 24th of June. And it shows, I think, the interconnectedness between SOAS and the regions over the past 100 years. So on to tonight's event. And the lectures in this series show how SOAS provides space for debate, for discussion, for asking the challenging questions about how we look at our world. And that's why, in this centenary year, SOAS launched the Questions Worth Asking campaign, so that students and academics can ask and keep on asking and sometimes answer pressing questions like, is there a solution to the world's refugee crisis? What happens after war? Should we all speak the same language? What makes a global citizen? And will there ever be equality? And throughout the campaign, we're seeking further support for our work here at SOAS in three ways. First, through scholarships, to enable people who, students from across the world, who would benefit from SOAS to come here. And I don't know if you've ever had in your life Anybody who's really believed in your potential? Anybody who's really invested in you? Well, that's what scholarships are about. Scholarships are about men and women, girls and boys, being able to realize their potential. And the second investment that we want to make is in the academic depth of SOAS, in academic projects, in uh, endowing posts. And thirdly, making sure that we put the student experience right at the heart of everything we do. And you can learn more about the campaign on our website under slash questions. So I have only two final things to say. Uh, one of them is the phone issue. Um, so don't be the person that everybody's glaring at because they have not switched off their phone tonight. Um, it's also being filmed, so the TV crews won't like you either. So just switch it to silent now. But we do encourage you to tweet, that's a hashtag, at um, hashtag SOAS100, uh, and do tweet away. 
And finally, I'm delighted um, to invite Professor Gilbert Ashkar, Professor of Development Studies and International Relations here, um, who took the initiative to invite Dr. El Baradai to give this lecture, um, to do what academics at SOAS are so really good at doing, to give us some context and to introduce the speaker. So, Professor Ashkar. Thank you very much, Ms. Thornton. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, dear uh, colleagues, dear students, good evening. <clears throat> um, you, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a very rhetoric formula to say usually that uh, the guest uh, doesn't need to be introduced. And uh, you know that it's not always the, the case. Uh, um, this time, it's certainly the case. I mean, this is certainly one of the most, uh, or the best known and most prestigious uh, persons of, uh, of our time that we are going to listen to this, uh, this evening, Dr. Muhammad Al-Baradei. Al um, let me get, nevertheless give you some background uh, uh, about, uh, about his, his biography. You may not know all aspects of it. Uh, we are, I mean, what you know for, for sure is that he is a citizen of Egypt, but he is also very much a cosmopolitan, a citizen of the world. Dr. Baradei studied law at the University of, uh, of Cairo and at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva and completed a doctorate in international law at NYU, New York University. His diplomatic career started 1964 with Egypt's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Soon he joined the, uh, I mean, various Egyptian missions uh, with, um, I mean, to the UN in particular in Geneva and in New York. In 1984, he joined the Vienna-based International Atomic Energy a Agency, the IAEA, as a senior staff member in various functions and responsibilities. He became Director General of the agency in 1997 and served in this very prestigious uh, position for three terms until 2009. He is currently Director General Emeritus of the agency. <clears throat> In 2005, as you know, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize jointly with the IAEA. Uh, back in Egypt, after the, the IAEA period, Dr. El Baradei became the most prominent figure of the Egyptian opposition the opposition to the rule of, uh, of Hosni Mubarak. In uh, 2010, he founded the National Association for Change, which regrouped all major components of the opposition. In this capacity, Dr. Baradei has been a major figure of the sequence of events that unfolded in Egypt starting from 25th of January 2011 until the brutal turn of events under Marshal CLCC in August 2013. Since then, Dr. El Baradei has been based in Vienna. Last but not least, I should say, Dr. El Baradei is the father of uh, Leila, who is here with, uh, this evening with her husband and daughter, and who is a, a SOAS alumni. I had the chance of counting Laila among my students in the very year when the Arab Spring started unfolding. And I must thank Laila, who was, who was instrumental in convincing Dr. El Baradei to give this lecture. So the lecture will last some 30 minutes and will be followed by 30 minutes conversation during which I will put a few questions to Dr. El Baradei. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming our most distinguished guest. Thank you very much.
Chairman Staunton, <laughs> Professor Ashkar, it's a real pleasure for me, an honor, to take part in your centenary lecture series. My daughter, Laila, a graduate of this institution, could not be more proud. My nine-year-old granddaughter, Maya, is also here today to see her grandpa in action. <laughs> Hopefully, she will take me more seriously afterward. <laughs> so as was established for Great Britain to understand the cultures of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, with a view to govern the empire more effectively, it was an early recognition that understanding other cultures, and not only hard power, is key to governance. Much water clearly has gone under the bridge since. The empire is no longer, and the world has undergone fundamental changes in terms of global values, including self-determination and human rights. The mission of SOAS has naturally been redefined as a result, but its core, its core remains unchanged. Communication between and understanding of various culture and values is key to our coexistence. The Brunei Gallery and the Japanese Garden above illustrates this awareness. Communication and mutual understanding among peoples and cultures seems to be a more urgent task than ever before, as our world is racing in a dangerous direction. We're witnessing senseless, destructive, dehumanizing conflicts and a growing mindset of Cartago de Lienda Est. We are seeing intangible walls erected through words and deeds between different cultures, religions, and people. We're watching the spread of terrorism and the horror and mayhem wrought by extremist groups. We're observing the corrosion of the limitations on the use of force, agreed to in the aftermath of World War II. And we're seeing the nuclear weapon states chest beating about their nuclear weapon arsenals and their strategic security value. President Trump's casual declaration that torture works and his Muslim ban, Yaroslav Kaczynski, the leader of Poland's ruling party, warning that refugees from the Middle East could bring diseases and parasites to Europe, and the Philippines President Duterte's declaration of a nationwide state of lawlessness are just some recent manifestation of emerging alternative values. The clash of values we have today, in my view, is between those who see a world based on hope, inclusiveness, and rule of law, and those who see one based on fear, segregation, and warranted repression. What's frightening is that some have started to draw a parallel between the world today and that of 1930s in terms of exclusionary and polarized societies, insurgent populism, economic crisis, refugees, institutional failures, and flouting of international norms. Are we at the cusp of a major conflagration which this time around could easily lead to self-annihilation? In 1952, the American statesman Adlai Stevenson said that, quote, we are now on the eve of great decisions, not easy decisions, but a long, patient, costly struggle, which alone can assure the triumph over the great enemies of man, war, poverty, and tyranny, and the assault upon human dignity, which are the most grievous consequences of each." Unquote. I'd like to use this insightful diagnosis of our enemies articulated over six decades ago 
to assess our success in combating them and what we need to do to achieve human dignity and peace. It just, as I said, it just shows you the amount of work we still have to do in this region and the ability to be able to talk to each other and reconcile with each other. Peace, I was going to say, has always been an elusive goal. Wars have dominated the human timeline since recorded history. Hundreds of millions have lost their lives to violence perpetuated under the guise of religion, nationalism, ethnicity, and other alleged casus belli. We can barely remember the causes of many of those wars. Some of the states involved no longer even exist. We organize ourselves in social units of city-states, empires, and sovereign states. We had the Peace of Westphalia, the Congress of Vienna, the League of Nations and the United Nations to regulate international relations. We created security system based on balance of power and later on collective security. But peace has remained fleeting and fragile with force and violence continuing to be our primary choice to settle differences. Our human conditions of late has become more absurd and contradictory. We have made huge leap forward in the way we understand our world and ourselves. Our innovations are incredible and, and our imagination is infinite. Ranging from artificial intelligence to quest for immortality and playing God. But at the same time, we have shown dismal failure to translate these advances into values and actions to stop slaughtering each other and uphold human dignity. We are simultaneously showing every day without shame, not only how high can we reach, but also how low can we descend. War, poverty and tyranny, and their assault on human dignity remain as shocking as during Stevenson time. In the recent past, the international community has done little more than wring its hands while millions of innocent civilians were slaughtered in Rwanda, Congo, Darfur, Afghanistan, Syria, and other places. We continue to judge the sanctity of life according to who is dying and where. Some conflicts, such as the Palestinian conflict, have been left to fester for generations. And the state seems to be steadily losing its monopoly over the use of power, as witnessed by the powerful non-state actors and militias that have sprung up across the globe. The response to humanitarian dis disasters is mostly in form by geostrategic interests. Humanitarian law intended to preserve a modicum of humanity in the realm of war and destruction is now almost always ignored. The responsibility to protect principle articulated with a great fanfare a decade ago to allow the international community to guard against genocide and other heinous crimes usually rings hollow. An effort to establish an international system of criminal justice through the International Criminal Court have been far from universal, given its lack of jurisdiction over most major powers. And while we see indictment and enforcement apply to the weak and defeated, almost always in Africa, we see nothing of the sort in the case of the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan where some major powers were involved. Poverty and hunger, although decreased in the last two decades, continue at depressing levels. According to the World Bank, 700 
and 67 million people live in extreme poverty on less than $1.9 a day. And 2.1 billion people live on less than $3.1 a day, the median poverty level. That's more than almost one third of, the, of, our, of the world. Millions die every year because of lack of access to medical care and inequality in the distribution of wealth between and within countries has reached obscene level. Brutal repression continues to be the hallmark of a third of the world nations. Uprising against tyranny and injustice continue in the Arab world, Africa, and other places. These uprisings are no different from those that took place elsewhere in the last few centuries. They are quest for human dignity. But as we also know from the past, the march for freedom is invariably long, chaotic, non-linear, and regrettably often violent. History tells us that while it is not difficult to coalesce against oppression, deprivation, and inequality, it's far more complicated to align around future courses of action. The central challenge has always been how to manage transition from an authoritarian to a democratic culture, including how to expunge the repressive regime how to achieve societal cohesion, we have seen some of that, how to settle disagreements peacefully, and how to eschew foreign interference. Building a functioning civil society and democratic culture and institutions are lengthy, time-consuming processes. Unfortunately, the trampling of human rights by authoritarian regimes is becoming almost spectator sport on the part of the international community, limited mostly to cynically voicing deep concern. Many democracies which advocate freedom and human rights invariably continue business as usual with the usual despots. When it comes to the choice between supporting the natives' right to freedom and dignity, and maintaining their cozy geopolitical and economic interests with the tyrants, the outcome is almost always clear. The argument is usually being that it is a choice between the bad, repression, and the much worse, chaos. We know that coping with dictators is tricky and complex. But we ought to have better options than regime change, dumb sanctions, or embracing the despots and arming them to the teeth. We ought also to be aware that supporting freedom and democracy has a cost in the short term, but will pay handsome dividends in the long haul. It is no surprise that the credibility of those democracies among people struggling for human dignity has almost vanished, paving the way to rising extremism. The loss of credibility has not been helped by reports of aiding and abetting torture and rendition and other violations of basic human values, such as target killing, a sense of cynicism and decaying values has emerged. As democracies, which were historically built as a role model, have lost their status. In a globalized world, poverty, inequality, and repression are, to my mind, the most lethal weapons of mass destruction. The plight of the poor, deprived of the most basic needs, the predicament of the millions of young people with dashed hopes and broken dreams, Rosco in Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment, the despair 
of the tortured, jailed, and oppressed create a poisonous environment of anger, humiliation, and dejection. A loss of identification with the state, a first step in, the, in its disintegration, and a fertile breeding ground for violence, extremism, even nihilism. Violence, radicalism, and anarchism continue to manifest themselves wearing different masks of ideology, religion, ethnicity, or nationalism to justify the most atrocious of crimes and attract supporters. And in many cases, conflicts are hijacked by outside powers looking for geopolitical gains in proxy wars. Syria is a, is a clear case in point. But it is the innocent civilians who foot the bill in the end, callously described as collateral damage. And even when they survive, they are often denied the most basic humanitarian assistance due to lack of resources. This year, more than 20 million people in East Africa are facing the threat of starvation and famine, 20 million people. The largest humanitarian crisis since 1945. Humanitarian agencies are practically begging for less than five billions to avert disaster. And of course, it's not that we do not have the money. The travesty is that we only devote around a mere 1%, 1% of the $1.7 trillion we spend on armament per year to disaster relief and peacekeeping operations. Last year, the number of refugees forced to flee their homes as a result of violence and war reached an estimated 65 million people, with over 21 million forced to flee their country altogether. The global response to the refugee crisis continues to be wretched. Pope Francis appealed to our sense of morality, quote, the gospel calls us, asks us to be near the littlest and the abandoned went unheeded. Those who followed a value-based approach and emphasized Wirtschaften das, like Angela Merkel, saw a loss of popularity and had to pull back. Barack Obama appealed to our instinct of security, quote, helping people who have been pushed to the margin of our world is not a mere charity. It's a matter of collective security, unquote. But his successor, has quite a different perspective. <laughs> Obviously, the solution to the refugee crisis is not through a population transfer, but we need to address the root causes of the problem, the persecution, the repression, the poverty, the extremism, and the wars. And above all, we need to adopt a humane approach that puts a premium on the sanctity of life rather than perceive it in callous terms of economic benefits. As Theresa May, then the Home Secretary, seemed to suggest when she remarked that, quote, high level of immigration make a cohesive society impossible and has a close to zero net economic benefit, unquote. The current refugee crisis, to my mind, is just a grim reminder of failed policies and crumbling values, where the chickens eventually do come home to roost. Quote, those who sowed winds are reaping whirlwinds, unquote, according to the Greek Prime Minister Tsipras. President Obama also noted that, quote, ISIL is a direct outgrowth of Al-Qaeda in Iraq that grew out of our invasion, which is an example of unintended consequences, unquote. He added dryly that, quote, we should generally aim before we shoot. <laughs> In this toxic environment, are we shocked when the mindset of some become, if you don't treat me as human being, why do you expect me to act as one? 
And if you don't care about my life, my hopes and dreams, why should I care about yours? These are not esoteric questions. In our interconnected world, our most significant threats have no borders and defy traditional notions of security. Terrorism, climate change, weapons of mass destruction, communicable diseases, cybercrime, illegal immigration, and illicit trust, drugs, and you name it. Our actions or non-actions eventually come back to halt us, wherever we are. No part of the world can remain quarantined any longer. In addition to distorted values, our policies and institutions have become anachronistic. At the national level, democratic institutions are facing a crisis because of their inability to adjust to a changing world and meet people's expectations of prosperity and fairness. Many are losing trust in the political class, leaving the door wide open for populism. Questions are being raised about the workings of democracy, including the money associated with it, the power and influence of corporations, and even the suitability of direct democracy to address complex issues, such as the mechanism, mechanisms of the EU or the intricacies of a peace agreement in Colombia through a referendum. International institutions suffer from structural deficiencies and lack of authority and resources. As a result, they are bursting at the seams, steadily becoming polarized and paralyzed. The chronic failure of the United Nations Security Council to take the necessary preventive measures or provide consistent and adequate responses to threats to international peace and security is a stark case in point. We are facing an outright crisis of governance. Governments which pursue short-term myopic policies, both in form hamstrung by party politics, which fail to cope with people's expectations or meet new long-term global challenges. There seem to be pull and push in conflicting directions. Movement to integrate into larger social units as is the case with the European Union and ASEAN, but also movement to split into smaller units, as was the case of the former Soviet Union, what was formerly Yugoslavia, and most recently was Brexit. The tension between the national and the global continues. At the international level, International institutions are desperately in need of reform. The need to reform the United Nations system has been universally recognized since the end of the Cold War. But efforts in that direction remain stymied because of short-sighted interest to maintain the status quo of a bygone era and petty competitions among states. As I mentioned earlier, it is quite disturbing that the limitation on the use of force, one of the great achievements of the United Nations Charter, is being increasingly ignored, as we see in Syria, Libya, Yemen, and elsewhere. Tony Blair not long ago mused that, quote, we have tried interventions and putting down troops in Iraq. We have tried interventions without putting in troops in Libya. And we have tried no intervention at all, but demanding regime change in Syria. It is not clear to me that even if our policy did not work in Iraq, subsequent policies have worked better." Uncle. The trouble with the examples mentioned by Mr. Blair is that all of them, in one way or another, sidestepped international legitimacy and international law whether by the invasion of Iraq, exceeding the Security Council mandate in Libya, or the not-so-covert intervention in Syria. 
Selective compliance with the law is not how to build a functioning world order. <clears throat> the continuing reliance on nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence as a centerpiece of our collective security system is horrifying. The argument that nuclear weapons have kept the peace is bogus and does not withstand scrutiny. A peace kept on the basis of doctrine of mutual assured destruction, mad as they call it, is irrelevant to extremists, based on the arbitrary premise that some are more equal than others, and underpinned by human fallibility, making it unsustainable, highly dangerous, and naive. It is evident that with the technology out of the box, and as long as some countries choose to rely on nuclear weapons, others will eventually seek to acquire them. With the odds of the use of nuclear weapons, by design or miscalculation, increasing by the day. We continue to live in a constant danger of sleepwalking in self-destruction. It burdens on insanity that we still have over 16,000 nuclear warheads, around 2,000 of which are on high status alert. Churchill chuckled way back that, quote, if you go on with nuclear arms race, all you are going to do is make the rubble bounce, unquote. All prominent strategic experts have argued forcefully that reliance on nuclear weapons is becoming increasingly hazardous and decreasingly effective. In 2011, former US Secretary of Defense Bill Perry talked about three false alarms he knew of in which Soviet missiles were thought to be screaming toward the US. Quote, to this day, I believe that we avoided nuclear catastrophe as much by good luck as by good management." Unquote. One of his predecessors, Robert McNamara, put it in starker terms. Quote, the indefinite combination of human fallibility and nuclear weapons will lead to the destruction of nations. But with all of the above, have we seriously started to take meaningful steps to get rid of nuclear weapons? Have we seriously tried to reduce our reliance on nuclear weapons in national security strategy? Have we seriously started designing a new security architecture in a nuclear weapon free world, including the need to deter and defeat possible cheats? After more than four decades, the nuclear weapon states are moving in the completely opposite direction. They are modernizing their arsenal to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. What is worse, recent reports indicate that the US has increased the targeting and killing capability of its existing ballistic missile force, and therefore its capacity for a surprise attack to fight and win a nuclear war. Experts tell us that with this will only lead to the deepening of mistrust, the hardening of an already aggressive nuclear posture, and the increasing possibility of nuclear response to a false alarm. The entire landscape is frightening and shameful. It shows no commitment whatsoever to nuclear disarmament and it undermines over time the legal and moral foundation of the non-proliferation regime. War, tyranny, and poverty, our enemies, are of our own making. They are the outcome of an environment we construct and a mindset we have cultivated. They all lead to the loss of human dignity, which in turn continue to fuel them this vicious circle must be broken. We need a new global paradigm where we generally subscribe 
to the values we often reference but really pursue, sanctity of life, equity, inclusiveness and diversity, solidarity and dialogue, and not one of double standard, polarization, humiliation, and use of force. Isolation and sanction are no policy, but a lack of policy. And it's often backfire, as we have seen lately in the example of Russia and North Korea. The recent effort of reconciliation between the US and Cuba and the US and Iran, by contrast, are instructive. After decades of hostility, we are back to where we should have started, trying through dialogue, trust building, and mutual accommodation to avoid violence and chart a, a path of peaceful coexistence. We clearly need to address global challenges through global responses based on the public common good, where the dig dignity of every human being is our first priority. We need to shift the focus from rivalry and competition to cooperation and complementarity, and emphasize values, policies, and institutions that promote dignity and champion freedom and equity, with zero tolerance for tyranny and repression. And we need a functioning system of collective security, where weapons of mass destruction has no place. If we cultivate the driver of peace, namely human dignity and freedom, we'll be able to understand that we are one human family, irrespective of superficial differences of race, religion, or ethnicity. In the world of William James, we are like islands in the sea, separated on the surface, but connected in the deep. The challenges we face are bigger than any single country, conflict, or issue. And none of us can or will prevail alone. We will either swim together or sink together. Somehow we have lost our way. It is time to adjust our mindset to save ourselves from ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baradai, for this uh, very stimulating talk and uh, our sincerest uh, apologies for uh, this disruption. Of course, you know, we could not uh, do anything about it. But as you said, it reflects this, the sorry state of, uh, of our region, the inability of some to distinguish between you know, Democrats and uh, dictators and the adherence to a vision of against us or with us and nothing in between. And also the, the fact that I'm sure these people would have had every opportunity to leaflet everybody at the entrance of this meeting. They would have had probably uh, had a little more sympathy than what they did, which was actually uh, very much counterproductive to any cause they wanted to serve. So again, our sincerest apologies for this uh, very regrettable. It comes answer. with the territory. Yeah. Sorry? It comes with the territory. Yeah. Yes. I'm used to that. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so thank you very much for this uh, uh, very thought-provoking uh, lecture. And uh, of course, no one would expect any optimistic perspective on the present state of the world and uh, indeed uh, the, the, the picture that uh, you drew uh, wasn't at all. Now I will uh, uh, try to discuss with you a, a number of specific points related to the, the global situation and your uh, expertise of course 
from the position where you were. Um, I mean, as you mentioned, one of the, the, the most uh, worrying aspects of the present world situation <clears throat> revolves on the, the issue of, uh, of nuclear weapons, of which you are definitely and indisputably one of the most uh, form, one of the foremost experts. And uh, as you know, very recently tensions have flared up, have risen dramatically uh, ever since uh, Donald Trump has become president of the United States. You have spoken yourself of uh, a risk of self-annihilation and it is, uh, in a sense, I mean, paradoxical that uh, we, to a certain degree, we feel today uh, less in safety than at certain, at least certain periods of the Cold War. Now, there are two key flashpoints on this issue, which are North Korea and Iran, and in which Donald Trump is directly uh, involved. So uh, let us start with uh, North Korea. How do you interpret the, the North Korean regime's uh, behavior uh, on the nuclear issue? And do you believe that the attitude adopted by the Trump administration uh, is the appropriate one, this kind of bullying uh, attitude? I think I look, I look at the North Korea situation, you know, and it's just like a bad old movie, frankly, to me, you know. Uh, it is, you know, if I summarize it, it is a security stupid, you know. That's what it's all about, you know. Whether we like it or not, North Korea, and I'm not in any way defending North Korea, but North Korea has its own sense of insecurity. I was once in Pyongyang and I had to listen for an hour and a half to a lecture by the foreign minister about how the US is after them since 1850. You know, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, that's what they believe, you know, that the US is after them. Uh, they are not, and again, I will quote my late Steve Bodworth, who was a US special representative to Korea, you know, until during the Obama administration. And he said, they are not stupid. If you work with them, you make progress. If you try to threaten them, they react the same, you know. Uh, I see there's no military option, you know. I, I, and despite all the junk we keep saying, there's no military option. Uh, you just need to talk to them. When I see the pendulum in the last few weeks, it's between, you know, we are going to use military to Mr. Trump saying, I will have the honor to sit with Kim Jong-un, you know. Well, something in between should be the way, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, it is not, I'm not, it's up to them whether it's an honor or not, it's up to them. You know, but both of them, I noticed last week, said we are ready, North Korea said we are ready to sit with the U.S. administration if the right conditions are met. A couple of days ago, the same was stated by the U.S. We are ready to sit with North Korea if the conditions are met. Why don't you sit together and work out these conditions? You know? <laughs> I mean, it just, it just, again, it's one of my favorite words. It's a kabuki dance. You know? We have seen this kabuki, you know, in Iran, in Iraq, in, in many other places, and we are in Cuba. In, but at the end of the day, unless you sit with each other, unless you treat each other with mutual respect, you don't have to agree with their system, you don't have to agree with the atrocities of human rights. These are different issues. But the, the major priority on the table is just to avoid self-annihilation. And that is not going to happen until you sit with North Korea. I can tell you something. I mean, there was an agreement, you know, with the North Korean to give them incentives, two free reactors at one point. But 
Unfortunately, I have to say that. I mean, the West was not honest about it. I mean, they made that offer on the assumption that the North Korea regime will evaporate before they give them reactors, the two reactors. Well, the regime did not evaporate. And, and the North Korean, of course, got even more mistrust. So basically, to, you know, unless you sit together, unless you try to build trust, unless you try to understand where they are coming from, things will get worse. You know, look at, look at Iran and, as I mentioned, look at Iraq, uh, Iran and Cuba. Cuba, for 50 years, you had this silly sanctions. Eh? And after 50 years, you've decided that, no, that doesn't work. In fact, it empowers the regimes in power. Let us, let us sit with them, talk to them, see, you know, see how we can build a modus vivendi. The idea that, and my friend Jack Straw, who is an honor to be, that he's here, uh, you know, we talked a lot about that, you know, that unless, unless you, you understand where people are coming from, if you want to change behavior, you need to sit and talk to the other party. For five years, we lost in Iran, and I think you'll ask me on that also. For size, five years, we lost in Iran because the Bush administration insisted that we are not going to sit with the Iranian unless they change behavior. But people don't change, change behavior. I mean, you talk to them to change behavior. Don't sit, you know, miles away and think they'll change behavior before. Talking to each other is not a reward. It's a means for coexistence. And I think that applies to Korea. That applies to many other places. Gilbert. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, well, you, you mentioned Iran. And, uh, yes, let, let us uh, turn to, to, to Iran. Uh, how do you rate the, the so-called Iran nuclear deal, that is the, the joint comprehensive uh, plan of action that the Obama administration, along with the other four permanent members of the UN Security Council and Germany and the EU, have concluded with Iran in 2015? Um, that is, more precisely, do you see any ground for the sharp criticism of the deal that has been expressed by the Saudi Kingdom, the Israeli government, the Republican hardliners in the United States, and most vociferously by Donald Trump himself recently? How do you assess all that? It's an excellent agreement, to my mind. Excellent. Absolutely. It's based on mutual understanding. You neutralize any possible fear from an Iranian program or weapon program or suspicion of a weapon program for 10 years. It gives you 10 years to work with Iran how to build mutual assurance and mutual security. I think all the criticism coming at it, it has to do with issues that has nothing to do with this agreement. It has to do with regional rivalry. It has to do with, you know, the Israelis want to be the only kid on the block with nuclear weapon, but nobody else has, you know, sort of symmetry. Uh, many of the Gulf states don't hate the Iranian policy, as they call it, of interference. So they do not want, you know, to have the regime you know, uh, free from sanction. But this has nothing to do with the agreement. The agreement is that it's a, an element of building a stability in the region, at least remove the nuclear holocaust prospect of it, either the Americans using it against Iran or Iran developing a weapon, uh, and then start to talk. I mean, the, the Middle East right now, and I didn't talk about that, is all the issues, development, tyranny, conflict, are all linked. I don't think you can resolve one without the other. My view is that you need something like Westphalia-type conference or the Paris Agreement in after the First World War. When you go with everything, put every issue on the table, 
and spend maybe a couple of years talking about it. You cannot, you cannot separate one security from development, from governance. We are, we are going nowhere like this, you know. And from that perspective, the Iranian deal is a deal that can be first step into building a region, new regional security paradigm. I can tell you again that after five years of wasted, wasted time on the Iranian issue, when Barack Obama came, and I, I give him credit for that. I mean, you can, people have different views on that. I think a month after he took power, he called me, and you know, I was the director general, we didn't expect the US president to call me. And I said, this is a priority for me. I want to engage the Iranian on the basis of what? Mutual respect. Use mutual respect, we got a deal. I can tell you again another anecdote. Uh, one of the foreign minister, Europe, major European country, who was involved in the deal for 10 years from day one, I asked him, I said, we could have gotten that deal six, seven years ago. And he said, not only that, but we could have gotten a much better deal from obviously a Western perspective. So, I mean, these are, these are lessons we should learn, and, but we usually don't, don't listen for, uh, learn from history better. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 And we know that it has been a recurrent theme ever since the Cold War. And most importantly, actually, after the end of the Cold War. Sure. For logical reason. Uh, as you mentioned just uh, Barack Obama, it was a key theme of his presidential campaign in 2008. And probably a major reason why he was uh, chosen for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009, which was the most unusual decision on the basis of intentions uh, before deeds. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, he, Obama's uh, Yes We Can proved um, to be much less real than Angela Merkel's uh, Wir das, das you, that you mentioned. And uh, this begs the question in, in some way, I would say, I mean, is nuclear disarmament truly a realistic perspective? Is, is it not a purely idealistic kind of, of a view? And if it is, if you believe it is a realistic perspective, how do you see the road to its achievement? I mean, is there anything consistent and possible between the option of uni unilateral disarmament and armament? Let's first come to the defense of the Nobel Committee, you know, <laughs> since, I, since I know something about that, at least. But, I think in many cases, they give the price to strengthen a person to pursue peace. And I think what they did in the case of Barack Obama was, as they sometimes mentioned, shot in the arm to strengthen his call for nuclear disarmament. Unfortunately, he didn't succeed, but it is not always the result of you know, achievement. It's a result of at least express intention. And, but you know, they can defend themselves. And I, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the nuclear disarmament, well, nuclear disarmament, if you see, you know, this is one of the follies, you know, which we have today. I mean, uh, the, most, the most lethal folly, frankly. When you see people like Henry Kissinger, you know, George Schultz, uh, Sam Nunn, Bill Perry, they came together and say, Nuclear weapons is the least effective and the most dangerous right now. These are not blue-eyed, you know, idealists. They are the ch children of, of the Cold War. Uh, everybody knows that when you continue, you know, on this path, more countries will get nuclear weapons. Any country who will feel threatened will get nuclear weapons. We know how the technology has been seeping through you know, to even Mr. Gaddafi, you know, Libya, you know, to Iran, to any country who feels threatened will act like the big boys. I mean, forget all the rhetoric, you know. If I am threatened today, 
Iran was a case in point when they were you know, invaded by the Iraqis you know, with the support of everybody to neutralize the Iranian revolution. If, you are, if chemical weapons are used against you, what would you do? Wouldn't you look for some option to defend yourself? But then, as I mentioned, Gilbert, we're living in a world basically saying we have 30, we have nine countries who have nuclear weapons. We have like another 20 some who, li who live comfortably under the umbrella. Uh, and then you have the natives who are saying you are on your own. Eh? You don't touch nuclear weapons. I might be a little bit blunt. Why is the UK, you know, renewing its nuclear weapon arsenal? Why is Germany able to live without nuclear weapons? Spain, Italy, many other countries. You know, you think this is, you know, the fact, I, I heard what the defense of it, that this is absolutely essential for our security. Well, if it is essential for your security, it might be essential for everybody else's security, you know. And if you want to live with a world that have 50 nuclear weapon states, well, thank you and goodbye. I mean, we, you know, we are. We are going to lose it, you know. And again, I can give you a hundred time of people from Rajiv Gandhi to Obama and every. Once, you know, I mean, when you get Bill Perry saying that he saw three false alarms and that we managed by good luck, managed by good luck. And when you talk about good luck, you talk about the survival of, our, of humanity. Well, how do we go about it? I think people, we need people, you know, the, the three million women who go into DC, you know, resisting. You need millions of people going everywhere, not only talk about climate change, not only talking about trade, but talking about security. Say, I do not want to live under Democles' sword. And governments are not going to move on their own. They need to be kicked somewhere. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> thank you. You mentioned Bill Perry several times, and uh, one could say that if the option he defended in the first Clinton administration had been pursued towards Russia, the world would probably be a better world today. Unfortunately, we saw what happened. Again, I People could have different views about Russia, about their human rights record, about, but I think we missed, I think we missed a marvelous opportunity to hug Russia in the late 1980s, when after the end of the Cold War, during Gorbachev time, Russia could have been part of NATO if we did need NATO at all. But what happened, we went, I, I mean, not we, me, but the West, you know, went using every opportunity to humiliate the Russian sense of dignity again. And then, you know, you got what you got in Russia. And you got, you know, the chickens are coming home to roost you in Crimea, in, in Syria. This is, again, the idea that we will prevail, that you dehumanize the others. You know, they are the... E we forgot the axis of evil, you know. I mean, these are these words make a diff, make a huge impact. When you call me an axis, of, part of an evil or an evil empire, what do you expect me to do? So, these are lost opportunities, Gilbert. But this is our again. This is what I'm saying. We we are moving. We are losing our ability to govern, both nationally because of the fantastic speed of technology development, government are not able to cope. International institution, and I used to head one of them, are mostly dysfunctional. You know, you know, when every day you hear that Security Council is going to meet tomorrow at three o'clock in the morning, I'd rather go to sleep, you know, <laughs> because I know that the outcome is zero. So it's, it is, we need to have the guts to, under, to revisit our ability to manage our world and acknowledge that the paradigm we have is not sustainable because the only sustainable one is based on equity, trust, dialogue, whatever values we talk about all the time but we don't practice. 
My final question will be about uh, Egypt, and I know for sure that uh, many that. in the audience, <laughs> <laughs> well, not exactly this kind of discussion. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the question will be very general, actually, to allow you to elaborate as you wish. Uh, what lessons do you draw from the revolutionary experience of 2011, 2013, and how do you see the future of the country? What lessons, and my wife can tell you a lot of the lessons, she was with me there, <laughs> but the first lesson is that you cannot switch from an authoritarian system to a democracy overnight. This is not, and this is, I keep saying that, it is not an instant coffee. Hmm? Some of the coffee branding are quoting me now and putting it on Twitter, by the way. <laughs> it is not an instant coffee. You need to give it time to brew. You know, democracy is about a culture. It's about institutions. It's about civil society. Without civil society, a functioning, vibrant civil society, parties, uh, NGOs, you cannot, you cannot move. Uh, you, you need the culture which and make people understand that synergy is the, is the way to move forward and not stabbing each other in the back, you know. Uh, so we need, we probably were over optimistic, naive, and in that we think that we move, you know, Egypt since 1952 is an autocratic authoritarian system, you know. Uh, we didn't, you know, so you, we, we should have understood that it takes time. You have to build step by step. Trans second, second lesson, transition is key. Transition is key, you know, and transition should not be rushed. I've been at that time calling for, let us take our times guide to move through transition. Most important thing is agree on a paradigm how to live together, which is basically values, what are the kind of values, you know, we all can agree to, irrespective of whether we are right, left, and center, you know, the Tea Party and the American Civil Liberty Union, they would be able to kill each other in terms of ideology, but they all believe in the U.S. Constitution, due process, you know, Supreme Court, what have you, you know, so we need, you need to go through a soul searching process of agreeing by consensus and not majority here of what the kind of values we can live by. We unfortunately have, you know, in Egypt and, and other, we have, and in, in the Muslim world, we have the so called Islamists, you know, and there is no really definition of what is Islamist is. I mean, we had some of them today, but these are not. What is exactly the definition of Islam? You know, you have Turkey, who is a Muslim majority state with a secular constitution. You have Saudi Arabia, who have saying the Quran is our constitution, and far and in between. The relationship between religion, religious institution, the state, the rule of law, morality, need to be defined. We have been grappling with that for 14 centuries. We haven't yet really sit together and say, let us define exactly that relationship. Uh, the second, second issue that obviously another problem that, and we see it in many manifestations, that we need, whatever you call it, we need to revisit the Islamic heritage, you know, and this is not, this is, there is a 1991, a decision by the summit of the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation State saying we need to revisit the heritage. The heritage is not part of the revered. You know, as the, the Quran is, is revered, but our understanding of it is not. You know, and that's a huge issue. We need to understand you know, that our understanding of religion is not sacrosanct. We need to revisit that. These are all issues that are there in Egypt and the rest of the Arab world that is connected again with the issue, Gilbert, of what is the kind of values we want to all accept. And 
what's the different, you know, how, what's the re role of the religion in the public and the private? You know, these are all issues fundamental. But these, as I said, you mentioned, I mentioned we need to take time, we need to, you know, be careful of how difficult the transition, we need to revisit the whole issue, which is very Arab or Muslim country specific, exactly how do we define the relationship? Because you had 100 different views on that, you know. And unfortunately, a lot of people abuse it. I mean, you see ISIL now, everybody say, we are talking in the, in the name of religion. They have nothing to do with religion. But we need to cut this umbilical cord of even a perception that Muslim, Islam has to do anything with this violence, with this terrorism. So these are issues that are not going to be uh, solved overnight. These are not going to be solved by the so-called elite. But this is, you know, in Europe, you, Europe went through the age of reason, you know, Renaissance, religious reformation, you know, you know while they were also going through, you know, slaughterhouse, killing each other, you know. From 17th century, when I, you see the 30 years war, religious war, when you see the Paris massacre of the Catholic killing the Huguenots, 30,000 were killed in Paris for, in a week, you know, uh, in the name of Christianity, the, name, the religion of compassion and love. So, Religion has nothing to do with this. It's, it's all pretext we use to express anger, hate, you know, inequality. And as I mentioned, we need, we need all these issues. We need to put it together in some pot. And hopefully, hopefully, we will come up with a different paradigm. I am, you know, I was reading the other day, you know, the world is not going to wait for us. Artificial intelligence is, is moving so fast. And the fear, which is serious fear, that we will create a robot who will then dominate us, who will be more intelligent than we are and be able to manipulate us. Maybe that's better because, <laughs> because we haven't done any better ourselves on our own. Thank you very, very much for this excellent lecture. Thank you very much.